we really are privileged to have this morning. I call him, he's, he's got the technical term of executive director for our Every Nation Family of Churches globally. Everybody say globally. Very few global leaders we have here. We have past, pr our president, Pastor Steve Merle, who uh, is over our family of churches worldwide. But I call him Mr. Vice President. In an age of a zany election, when, my God, who do we vote for? Well, we have a ticket. It's called Merle and York. And they should run, and I would vote for them. And so he's going to close our series all in with a very good message on generosity, but it's beyond money, but it has to do with your emotions and your heart. And we're about to enter a new season of mission. We're about to complete our building, and we'll hear about that a little more as we come. But the most unique thing about Pastor Kevin, he's done it all, worked in the marketplace, been very successful there, uh, has done church planting, church buildings, and now he helps on our corporate global team, as I call him the number two man who really runs things. But he's got a unique family, and I'm going to have you have, have him explain the cosmopolitan mix in this most unique family. But without shame, I would like for you to ask, ask you to stand to your feet and welcome Mr. Vice President Kevin York. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. That was a, that was a frightening ticket. Merlin York. Whoa. My family wouldn't vote for me, not in the president's seat. Um, it's such a privilege to be here. Um, I, my wife hates to travel, and I've been traveling for decades, millions of miles. Stewardesses know your name. That means you just go too much. And, um, and I have had every kind of plane disaster from engines blowing on takeoff to flap sticking and hot landings and all kinds of emergencies and stuff. And so my wife does not like to fly at all for any reason. She does, she's like Norman. She doesn't want to get in a little bitty tube and go for hours. And so, but before I left, because she hears me talk about this place when I leave, she, th this is a miracle. So I'm telling her that hundreds of people have heard her confession. And if she doesn't, she's a liar. So I'm going to manipulate her when I get home. After 38 years, you can manipulate. She looked at me and she goes, Kevin, next time you go, I want to go see what Norman has done. So my next trip, I will have my stunningly gorgeous wife sitting by me when I come. So you'll get to meet the real side of us. But we do have a crazy family. Um, I was raised a heathen, so if you've not been in church, I was not in church till very late in my 20s. So I didn't know anything about church, but um, my, so we had three kids and my oldest daughter, it was not a surprise that growing up in a Latin world, because that's the world I grew up in, was not very white. It was very Latin. It was very Hispanic. It was very much influenced by Mexican culture. And so most of my friends were Mexicans and my daughters had Mexican friends and African-American friends. Those were their two dominant it's just where we grew up. And so it wasn't a surprise that my oldest daughter married a Mexican. Um, he's amazing. He's a bodybuilder, so he looks just like me. His <laughs> biceps are the size of my legs. So he's the same proportion, just in different places. And so um, my legs are very similar to his biceps. But he's, he, he is actually, bench press is almost 500 pounds, and that's, you know, quite a lot of lot of weight. So he's, and he's an incredible businessman, a chief partner in a gazillion dollar business. He works hard. He's a fantastic guy. So they give birth to a mocha child and a latte child. And then they adopted two from Ethiopia. So they have brown and white, mocha latte, black, black. And that's their, just them. When they walk into a restaurant, you typically get very confused. And so my middle daughter, she married an African-American. He owns his own business and upskills and trains NBA players and D1 college players and then a bunch, hundreds of kids where he takes them in and upskills them. And so, and a lot of international basketball players from countries that are on teams, you know, I guess Olympic teams and stuff like that. And he's equally built like me, has a, you know, a six pack on his stomach and all that stuff, 360 behind the back, slam dunk, can shoot the lights out at three, just like me. And so your, your kids do marry, you know, like you. He's airbrushed, just like my daughter. And so they gave birth to every kind of 
hue and hair texture and eye color under the sun. Like, we don't even know what to call them. Three. And then to confuse everybody, they also adopted one from Ethiopia. And uh, so they're amazing. They're, they're just every color under the sun. And then my, we call my son and we sit down and we said, we got Europe covered. We got South America covered. We got Africa covered. And so you have to marry an Asian. And, and because we're extremely well organized as a family, we strategic planning, that was part of our thing. And so he fell in love and married an original Asian, born and raised in Manila, 100% Filipina. And, uh, and they had their first baby. My son came to me and he goes, Dad, he, goes, Dad. he said, I, is it okay to pray that the baby before the baby was born looks Asian? I said, well, of course. If it's not, we're going to trade it in and we're going to have to start all over. <laughs> he goes, well, I'm a little concerned because if I pray, what if it, what if he like drops out and looks like me? I said, well, definitely trade him in and then get another <laughs> one. And um, so the good news is this, their baby looks totally Asian. And so when my family of 22, we have nine grandkids, my parents, when we walk into a restaurant, nobody knows who's with who. <laughs> nobody. And so when I signed up to be a part of leadership of a church, family, every nation was the only one that would take us. <laughs> so that's actually the reason I got this chair. It has nothing to do with skill. Is they looked at my family and go, you're every nation, so we're going to take you. Um, so I feel like I'm at home with all of you because you look very similar to my family, uh, very similar, and it's a privilege to be here. So a little bit of self-disclosure before we open the Bible. Um, this is a very embarrassing sermon for me to preach, um, but I feel like, you know, when you're not raised in church and you get saved, um, I'll never forget doing something that is pretty profound to a non-church person. And that's opening up the Bible and beginning to read the Bible to a soul who has not been formed and framed by the church. There were things that were in the Bible that were very shocking to me. Now, as a non-Christian, I, I, I assumed the Bible would have a moral code, you know, you know, don't be funky, don't sleep around. You know, I knew that it would have a moral code. And so one time my best friend, former pastor, asked me this. He goes, so Kevin, what in your opinion, um, what in your opinion was the most shocking thing uh, that you found when you begin to read the Bible? I said, well, there are two things. I was stunned by how much the Bible talked about our emotional life. I was shocked. Just how God wants you to feel right. And I said, the second thing was money. I was stunned at how much the Bible talked about and how much particularly Jesus talked about money. I said, those were the two biggest issues that I wrestled with in Scripture, which means this. I was totally captivated by money and didn't know it, and I was emotionally screwed up and didn't know it. How many of you, when you married your mate, you thought, okay, they're a great deal, and then you moved in together and realized they're emotionally screwed up? <laughs> and so when we crack open this section of the Bible, you're going to see these two things at play here. You're going to see how radical Jesus was about these two issues, your emotions, your passions, and possessions. And you're going to see he was speaking to a crowd. I'll set the table before we look at it. He was speaking to a crowd of, we think, thousands on a hillside. Most scholars say this is one of the greatest orations that have ever came out of the mouth of a human being, and it's called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, if you pull back and read the whole Sermon on the Mount, you're going to be struck by something that he talks more about 
possessions than any other singular thing in the entire Sermon on the Mount. And he moves in and out of these conversations, teachings about that. So here I was in the marketplace long before I was a preacher, dude. And how many of you think if you're going to be a preacher, dude, you want Jesus to change you emotionally and you don't want money to be the Lord of that pastor? How many of you think that's a good idea? That's a good thing to have die in you is you're being controlled by money and at least to have Jesus somewhere showing up in your emotions. So Jesus is speaking to this crowd. And he just talked to them about being generous to the poor. And then he moves into prayer and how you should pray. And then forgiveness. And then he's right back on money. And then he unpacks this thing that we're going to look at. He talks about two treasures, two eyes, and two masters. And then he goes into worrying about money and how you shouldn't worry about money. And it's the dominant theme in all, and you would think he is preaching to the wrong crowd. You know, before you preach, you're supposed to exegete the audience. You're supposed to know who you're speaking to. How many of you know if my sermon was apropos to professional NBA basketball players and I preached it here, you might think he's an idiot. He didn't know who's going to be sitting here. Well, if you read that Sermon on the Mount... If you don't see possessions like Jesus did, you would have thought that the fact that most of those people were poor, you would think, Jesus, this is the wrong audience. What is, what is generosity? What is, what is it to be greedy? What does greedy mean? Now you can go to Webster and look up greedy, and it's a pretty weak definition. But you, you open the Bible and you look at the Bible, especially if you haven't been raised and pickled in church like me, and you open the Bible, oh, it's a robust definition. It is a definition that goes to the core of who we are as humans, the core. Included in its definition of greedy people are kings in the Old Testament that demanded money from their subjects that they shouldn't have gotten. They, they stole from you. That's called greedy. How many of you know that's okay? That's greedy. But do you know that the Old Testament also says that if you're lazy and you want to take other people's money for your own use, it uses the term greedy for that person. That's a head scratcher. And then Jesus really goes to the heart of that issue here in the book of Matthew. So I want you to take out your Bibles. I want you to open them up to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Jesus is nearing the end of his sermon on the mount. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Now, this, this particular passage was my undoing in the office when I worked for Texaco. At lunch, I would read my Bible. I would pray every morning from 5 to 6 for an hour, get my car drive to work. And at lunchtime, I would spend an hour in the Word. And this, this passage changed my life and it's very embarrassing he says this he says do not lay up for yourself Matthew 6 19 do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Everybody say two treasures. Say that real loud. Say two treasures. Jesus brings this idea to the table, to these poor, a few middle class, and maybe one or two rich people. And this is what he says. He said there are two kinds of ways to invest your money. There's a way that is 
investing in things that just are temporary. You know, how many of you know that when you buy a car, it begins to fall apart from the moment you get it? I mean, you know, it's very temporary. I mean, the law of entropy exists on everything. You move into your brand new house and immediately it begins to fall apart. And you got to start fixing stuff. In fact, you get your stuff and you buy stuff to take care of your stuff and then you have to buy stuff to fix your stuff that takes care of your stuff. Everything that we do in this life is temporary. Everything. It is wasting away. Now, he doesn't say don't spend any money there. But that, he identifies that as one of our treasure. That's one thing that we put money in. But then he identifies another bucket. He says, or you can take your money, and you can begin to put your money in things that change people eternally. Now, how many of you know your vehicle doesn't change anyone eternally? A Maserati, now, I'm a car guy. I've heard you are too, Timothy. So this hurts both of us to say this. A Maserati doesn't change anyone's life any more than a Nissan. That was hard for me to say and confess, but, but it is true. But there's, there's something else behind this. And as I kept reading this, I kept thinking, um, not only do I not give any money to anything that will reap an eternal benefit, I don't want to give money to anything that will reap an eternal benefit. And at some point, it dawned on me that I had a common disease in humanity that Jesus knew existed in that crowd he was talking to. It's called common greediness. It's like the common cold. No one would have ever accused a commonly greedy person of being greedy. I had normal greed. You wouldn't look at my house and go, whoa, he's greedy. You would go, whoa, he's normal. You wouldn't look at my car and go, what a greedy, look at that, he's got a, he's got a Nissan. I'm offended by your Nissan. Because you see, our view of greed is behind a gate, right? It's in the penthouse suite. We could, how many of you know, you can accuse little greedy people. Greedy people are people on Wall Street. We all know that. Greedy people are those corporate executives in the boardrooms. They're greedy. Jesus blows that to pieces. But you see, I, that was my view of greed. I thought I was generous because the Girl Scouts would bring their cookies. And how many of you know that's like manna? How many of you know that's, how many of you are addicted to Girl Scout cookies? Okay, confessions. Well, let's just close. We'll pray. There's a, the rest of you are lying if you're not addicted to those cookies. You just haven't eaten enough of them. The Girl Scout would bring me cookies. And, the, and this is why everybody thought I was generous including me. They would bring the cookies and I would pay for the cookies. I'd double the amount and then tell them to keep the cookies. That is really generous, isn't it? I'd go to a restaurant and I would 20% tip everybody, maybe 30, sometimes 50. See, you're impressed. The Generous, right. That's what I thought. Until I opened the Bible and it, it, it decimated me. Because I realized that my life was not only not generous, that it wasn't even close to generous, but that I had never taken a lot of my money, a lot, and begin to shove it, give it away to things that would make an eternal difference. Building a Sunday school department, 
that long after I'm dead, it's going to be cranking, cranking, cranking out. Giving money to the poor that have very little, just lots of money. Pushing less of my money towards my stuff and more of my money the other direction. And I remember the moment that I looked at my wife in a church service. I didn't learn any of this from like offerings or anything. Because remember, I was an idiot kid. I didn't know anything. I'm reading my Bible. And I turn to my wife and I go, give me the checkbook in a church service. She goes, why do you want the checkbook? You know, your wife always gets nervous when you ask for the checkbook. Mine does. The reason we're married 38 happy years is because I give her all of my money and all of my love. And she gives me lunch money back. (laughs) 38 years of that, she's happy. She's just happy. Um, So I took the checkbook, and I truly did this. One moment. It was a moment in time. And I wrote a gigantic check. Could have bought a house. And that would have been the payment. That was the day, and I'll never forget, she won't either. She turned, she turned like lifeless. She quit breathing. Her heart stopped. She gasped. After church, she goes, what are you doing? I looked at her and I said, I'm greedy. She goes, you're not greedy. I said, it's a long story. God is dealing with me, honey. This has far-reaching ramifications in my soul, and I don't even know what it is. But I have to start giving lots of money away. It's hard for her to comprehend, but she said, okay. Now, the horror was, it was fast to move my money there but not my heart oh you can get to writing the tithe check far quicker than you can liking it remember when I said emotions only half of repentance is done when you act on it it's completed when you love it The difference between a religious person and a person that Jesus has passionately transformed their life is they don't just know to do good and then do it. They know to do good and they do it and they fall in love with it. And they're no longer a slave to the law. They have entered the freedom. So you can move your money quickly, but you can't move your emotions that quick. When you move your money, you find out where your heart really is. And it was horrible for me. Horrible. The discovery of moving lots of my money until it altered my lifestyle, because generosity in the Bible is a ton of money. It alters the way you live. When you read the Bible, what was shocking to me is it's like when you open the door to generosity, it's like 10%. But every example from old to new is just a ton of money. And it changes you. And I wish I could stand up here and say that I wasn't that dark and I wasn't that evil but I had friends that were generous. Very generous. Some of them lower middle class friends and they gave boatload. It altered their lower middle classness. They probably lived like lower class people. I had wealthy friends that were generous. Tons of money they would give away. And I didn't understand it. They had a smile. They were passionate about it. And Jesus identifies here. He says, there are two treasures. And you're going to invest in both of them, maybe. If you're young, please learn this now. 
You take your resources and begin immediately to obey God and begin to, you change your lifestyle. This took me years, guys. This took years. This takes years. You know, most of Jesus' deep work isn't an instant deep work. It takes years. So I kept shoveling, 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 shoveling. Couldn't figure out why my friends shoveled and were glad about it. I would shovel and walk out of there thinking I could have bought another house. That could have been income when I was retiring. And my chief lust, which is speed and cars. I remember we were in, my wife and I were in Notting Hill, London, back before most of you were born. And we were walking up Notting Hill, and uh, there was a Maserati dealership, car dealership. And in the showroom floor was the, the most expensive of all Maserati's. It was two-seater, glove leather interior. It was light powder blue. I'll never forget it. Notice the curves were unbelievable. Whoa, those curves. My wife is looking at me, standing by. She said, you would have left me for a car, wouldn't you? I could, any day. I would have, this, oh, gosh, honey, look at those curves. Man, when you start that, look at, listen to her voice. She says, oh, oh, that voice. And I wish that was just kidding. I thought of all the things that moths and rust would destroy that I could have had if I wasn't shoveling all this money away. Move your money to the eternal and you'll find your heart. Now, over time, Jesus was faithful. And I changed. Everybody say two treasures. There are two treasures, and you get to choose where you're going to move your money. Now, the second part of this, he, so he, this is profound to me. I mean, to this day, you see, I don't, I don't have notes. When Norman called and said, would you speak on that? I didn't, I didn't prepare for this. You might say, I know you should. Um, this is deep in me. This is deep in me because it's transformed me. Two darkest things in me were emotions and money. Then he says this. So he, he identifies. He goes, look, if you start shoveling tons of money and alter the way you live, quit charging stuff and alter the way you live. Downsize so you can give. I know that's not, you won't hear this in most pulpits in America. And shovel, just shovel. Eventually you'll turn out like my other friends, not like me, my other friends. Then he says this. It seems like Jesus kind of took some drugs or something. He goes, he's two eyes. Everybody say two eyes. Say a good eye. Say a bad eye. Say a stingy eye. A generous eye. That's what he's about to talk about. He says the eye is the lamp of the body. Seems like he changes the subject, but he's not. The eye is the lamp of the body. He says, so if your eye's healthy, your whole body will, listen to this, be full of light. That word healthy means generous. Better translation would be just generous. If you have a generous eye, your body's full of light. He says, but <laughs> if your eye's bad, if you got a bad eye, if you got a stingy eye, he says, if you're a stingy eye, your whole body will be full of darkness, but then listen to what it says about that. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? What is he talking about? He's talking about this. He's saying, if you've got a bad eye, you think it's a good eye. 
If you have a stingy eye, money is so deceptive, you think you're generous. Are, are you hearing Kevin York in that? This, this did me in. The eyes. I had a stingy eye, but I thought it was generous. And if you think you're generous, but you're stingy, you are full of darkness. Full of darkness. And how great is that darkness? The darkest you'll ever be is to be deceived to the degree that you think you are generous and you are not. And that level of darkness is dark. You see, when you shovel your money, you find your heart. When your heart finally gets there, everything that you see in life changes. Now I look at a church building, oh, radically. I never knew why this guy named Jim and why my friend named Shane and all these people I knew that were so generous. I never knew that when they had an opportunity to give, to do something that would far outlast them long before they were dead, I didn't know why they were so thrilled. Later, I looked at one of them and asked for $400,000, and they stroked the check, and they gave it to us, and we stuck it in. And the reason is because they had good eyes. You see, when you have a good eye, you look at everything in life way differently. And instead of perhaps you need to call the church, you say, perhaps I'm the reason that I see this need. That changes the way you see everything in life. <laughs> and listen, this is the great news. You'll love your stuff like stuff was supposed to be loved you will actually enjoy your stuff more than you'll ever enjoy your stuff if you do it like the pagans. See, the chief thing of paganism is the more you get, the more it takes, or you feel less and less about it. That is, it has the law, paganism has the law of diminishing returns. You get this Maserati that's good for a year or two and they're no longer buzzed about it. So you get this Maserati. You're not buzzed about that Maserati. So you get this Maserati. And you're always wanting a bigger, a better, a newer, a better. Oh, that's, that, that's it. But when your eyes change, you love yourself, you hug your Nissan or your Maserati. But you hug it different. You look at it and go, I love you because you never get in the way of me giving. You love your house. You hug it. You kiss it. You take care of it. You sit there. I told my wife, we have this little bitty tiny house. We just, we sold the big house with little land. We got big land and a tiny house. And so she was so concerned that I would hate this little bitty, and it's even small for island. She thought I'd hate it. I love it. Because you see, when you move your heart and Jesus gives you a new view of stuff, that means over the whole course of your life, in seasons of great wealth and in seasons, you keep reorganizing your life so that nothing gets in the way of you giving. And then you understand what it is to enjoy your stuff because your stuff isn't in the way and when stuff is not in the way whether you have a penthouse in Waikiki or you have a Coleman tent on the side of a mountain it doesn't get in the way and you love your penthouse or you love your tent then you can be a billionaire and enjoy because you give until it hurts. Or you can be poor and you enjoy your common tent because you're free. You're free. Then he dives into this last thing. And the reason I spend so much time on the first two is you don't get the massive, this almost seems cruel to say this, what Jesus is about to say, unless you get the first two parts. If I say two masters, Wake up, check your neighbor, say, are you still alive? You're not, 
you know, you haven't breathed for a while, you've been asleep, slap them. I noticed Norman said, slap your neighbor in the first service. I was going to hit Paris in the face. He goes, no, 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 shoulder, the shoulder. I didn't know that. I thought I was just obeying, so I was going to slap him in the face. And now, this is, he drives it home with this, and then I'll end on this, because they gave me a drop dead time. I said, I hope that's not when I'm supposed to drop dead. That's, that's when my sermon's supposed to end. And so, it's about to say, you're dead. Um, no one can serve two masters. Two, say two masters again. Say two treasures. Say two eyes. Say two masters. He says this, no one can serve two masters. Now, notice he doesn't say this. He doesn't say it's hard to serve two masters. He doesn't say it's hard. That's, that's my cue. He doesn't say it's hard. He says no one can do it. He says no one can serve two masters for he'll, he'll either hate the one and love the other. Now, if you get the eyes and you get the, if you get it, you get this. You get it. If you don't get those first two things, you don't even get this. He says he'll either hate the one and love the other or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot. Wow. Now, if you were me in my little Texaco office, And, and I don't know anyone that this was darker in than me. I haven't met them yet. Two years. I spent two years on this in my office. Trying to figure out an end run. He sh surely in the original Greek it didn't mean you can't serve two masters. But you really can't. Because of what's next, two preoccupations. Say preoccupations. Say preoccupations. You are occupied now as a believer in a world of freedom that's amazing. You walk around like my friend Jim. Jim was a serial giver. You would have never thought he was that. You would have thought he was a janitor somewhere, but he was opulently wealthy. He wore T-shirts and jeans, and they weren't even nice jeans. And they were terrible T-shirts. And he drove a block car and lived in a normal house. He had a normal house. But he was loaded, millions. And he was single. You could tell by the way he dressed. He was single. <laughs> and he wasn't going to attract people that way. Um, I actually told him he was a fool if he didn't marry this certain girl, and so he called her and asked her to marry him. Uh, it's the only time I ever did that. That's not normal for me, but Jim was a serial giver. He would come up and ask me questions about these single women in our church, and I always thought it was because he was interested. But he would ask me questions, and it took me a long time to figure out what was going on. What he was was... He had made it a goal that the single women in our church that had children would never want for money. And he took it as a personal project. Oh, he tithed. Oh, he gave big, giant checks to the building. But he was a secret, like, son of Sam kind of giver. Pick you off give you big money. And the day, I'll never forget the day it dawned on me. I'm walking through the hall after church and he had asked me about this single woman with lots of kids. What was her situation like? And so I told him a little bit. And, uh, and Jim said, oh, okay. He was very like stealth. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I'd go, Jim, what do you think? What do you think it? He goes, yeah, she's, she's gorgeous. She loves Jesus. Just wanted to know, you know, da, 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 and then walk off. So I walk around. There's a group of ladies, and they're crying. They're all bawling like babies in the hall. And so, you know, if you're the pastor, you're kind of, wow. It's a, so I walked by, knew two of them, and they said, you wouldn't believe it. And they told me the story of this girl that I knew, and she had all these kids, and how horrible it was economically for her. And just magically, thousands of dollars appeared. 
thousands. And that's when the light switch went off. Because see, he was preoccupied with something. Like all of my other giving friends, they were just preoccupied. My middle class friend, named Rick. He was preoccupied with this thing called giving. We were over one night for their dinner. Very low, low middle class over there for dinner. And a guy came and they were having a hard time. You know what he did? He took, and he tithed and he did all, but he took these garbage bags and he and his wife, Mita, started scooping in all half of everything they had in their food. And then gave him gas money. They're preoccupied because they had good eyes. Because they learned the value of treasure being put in the kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we ask you. Jesus, by the greatness of your spirit and your power. that you would go to the depths of every person's soul that's here now. That Jesus, like that first crowd when they heard, I pray that this crowd would hear, and if this is applicable, your Holy Spirit would convict and guide, take every one of these persons on a journey of generosity. In Jesus' name. Thanks for joining us. Visit our website at pearlside.org for more.